Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Giving Voice to People Affected by Parkinson's. Before we move off this initial slide, can I draw your attention to the hashtags, hashtag Parkinson's and hashtag RCSLT webinar, and invite you to make use of those should you so desire. My name is Derek Mann. I'm the Director of Policy and Public Affairs here at the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, and we're delighted to be joined today by Professor Nick Miller, the Professor of Motor Speech Disorders at Newcastle University, and Claire Worrell Hill, who's Professional Engagement Manager at Parkinson's UK. I need to run for you through a little bit of housekeeping. The webinar is 45 minutes long, so those of you who are interested in the game kicking off at two o'clock, you'll be done in time for that. You'll see interacting on the right hand of your screen your name and the name of the panellists in the list of participants, but please be aware that there are many others online too, um, and your host Kaylee will keep you updated by the chat stream during the event. Use the Q&A button if you'd like to ask a question to the panellists about the content of the webinar. If you've got more of a technical issue about sound or the slides, then use the chat function and contact Kaylee and she'll get back to you. The event is being recorded, will be online with the slides about a week from now and we'll, we'll give you the link for that. I should say some of the slides are quite detailed, but don't worry about that, they'll all be online for you to look at. So just sit back and listen for today. I should also say that we'll be focusing today on the communication impact of Parkinson's. Obviously, there's also a swallowing impact, and there will be some online material about that, and we might come back and do a, another webinar in due course. We hope that 45 minutes from now, you'll be familiar with how speech and language therapy can support people affected by Parkinson's. You'll know about the UK Parkinson's Excellence Network and the support it offers professionals, and you'll know a little bit about the support that the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists offers its members in this field. So, delighted once again to welcome Professor Nick Miller of Newcastle University. Nick, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nick Miller, and I'm going to talk to you about the communication changes that are associated with Parkinson's. The content is directed mainly at people with Parkinson's and their families and friends, and speech language therapists who aren't uh, necessarily experts or specialists in the field of Parkinson's. And also, I'm hoping it'll be uh, of meaning to other health and social services colleagues who want to know about speech language changes in Parkinson's. I'll be covering how Parkinson's affects communication, what the main directions are for intervention, and I'll give some key overall messages to take away. So how can Parkinson's affect communication? And the answer is that Parkinson's affects all aspects of communication. So it affects voice, it affects the intonation, the stress and melodic uh, aspects of speaking. And around 80, 90 percent of people with Parkinson's can expect those, those kind of changes to take place. Somewhat over uh, half of, of people with Parkinson's report changes to their speech. Communication is also affected by the reduction in facial expression and the reduction in uh, hand and arm gestures which are found with Parkinson's. And also Parkinson's can affect language, by which I mean uh, finding the words or putting the words into sentences. And what listeners might notice uh, from those changes is that the voice of somebody with Parkinson's is uh, softer, is quieter, and, and sometimes the person with Parkinson's isn't, isn't aware that they're speaking more quietly. The speech of somebody with Parkinson's tends to sound all on one level of loudness and all of one level of pitch because of the loss of the, the variation in intonation and variation in uh, stress patterns that form part of speech usually. Sounds may be slurred, words sound as if they run together, uh, it sounds as if some words m might be left out of the sentence. Listeners uh, speaking with somebody with Parkinson's might be un unsure of how the person's feeling or, or what precisely the emotion is they're trying to convey because of, again, because of the lack of facial expression or the reduction in arm and hand gestures that typically accompany speech. And the changes to language mean that either the person with Parkinson's might sometimes be missing the meaning of what's being say, said, or they themselves might find difficulty and it's un unclear 
uh, when they come to express themselves cer certain ideas. And if we add all this together, then we can see that it affects getting into conversations and staying in conversations, which has an impact on employment if you're, you're still working. It obviously has an effect on your social activities and day-to-day and -day situations which you might encounter. It also, we know, has a, uh, can have a profound effect on uh, the person with Parkinson's as a communicator, so communicating no longer is pleasurable, it's an effort to speak, and this carries with it the risk of withdrawing from communication. I'll say a few more words about what I mean by language changes. So if uh, one asks people with Parkinson's, well, what ways has your communication changed? Uh, the kind of uh, statements they might come up with is that oh, sometimes I can't find the words or by the time I've worked out what the person meant, the topic's moved on or it's a real problem expressing my ideas or I'm always getting lost in conversations or I, I can't even get into the conversation in the first place. Maybe listeners, their, their family and friends notice, oh, he doesn't seem to understand jokes like he used to. And these experiences are directly linkable to other changes that are found in Parkinson's, in particular changes to attention, changes to problem solving, to short term and working memory, and to the speed of processing your thoughts. And if we think about conversations, well, conversations require sustained attention and not being distracted by other things going on in the environment. They require problem solving to get to sort out the order of your thoughts and get your thoughts into an expressible form. Conversations involve switching of attention from one speaker to another, from one topic to another. And we know that people with Parkinson's face a particular difficulty with, with switching sets, with switching thoughts and ideas and actions. Conversations require quick thinking and speaking. So if speed of processing is affected, that can affect conversations. Um, you need to keep track of your own thoughts, formulate an answer while you find a word, while you concentrate on your speech. And also, uh, in conversations, a lot of what speakers mean isn't said exactly in words, it's between the lines, and this applies especially to appreciating irony, expressing irony, humour, doubt, agreement. And to expand on that, just for a few minutes. This, how does the, do these subtle changes to language affect communication in Parkinson? So if you have problems interpreting or producing the right tone of voice, the right melody of voice, it can lead to problems such as confusing or mixing whether the person's intending to say, you're coming tomorrow, or you're coming tomorrow, or whether you're saying a lovely green house, or a lovely greenhouse. When it comes to difficulty expressing or understanding irony or sarcasm or humour, then the, the confusions might be between, oh, that's a nice dress, meaning, oh, yes, I, I, I like that, versus, oh, that's a nice dress, I wouldn't, wouldn't be seen dead in that, or you've arrived at last, S said with a feeling of concern, oh, dear, what happened to you, versus, oh, you've arrived at last, I've been waiting half an hour here for you, where on the earth have you been? And also, with the, diff the subtle changes to, to stress and intonation and tone of voice that can occur in Parkinson's, so an understanding of words, then you can uh, have difficulty of differentiating between the literal and the inferred meaning of phrases like he's a real fighter, meaning he is, he's always getting into fights, versus he, he's somebody who, who keeps on the task, or getting the wrong end of the stick, meaning metaphorically versus but not as a person with Parkinson's. Some people with Parkinson's with, with these kind of difficulties might think, well, where, where's this stick that you're talking about? So if we go back to, to the statement of, of people saying it's difficult to get into conversations, um, how do these, these changes account for that? To get into a conversation, you must give, a, give listeners cues that you're ready to take your part in the conversation. These might be verbal cues, so which are affected in Parkinson's because you can't initiate your speech, your voice is as readily, as quickly as you used to be, be able to, or the changes in loudness, people don't notice that you, you're trying to get into the conversation. Also, the lack of non-verbal cues, so reduced facial expression or reduced arm gestures or altered body posture can affect also getting into a conversation. But even once you've got into the conversation, then listeners expect certain cues that uh, you want to continue with your turn. So, But if you make a pause that's too long or in the wrong place, then listeners might interpret that as you've finished your turn and, and they butt in with, with something. Or because they're not getting the the eye contact or the facial expression messages that you intend to continue with your turn, then again, they, they jump in. 
and also over the last decade or so it, it's been realized that that people with parkinson's have issues around theory of mind and social discourse that's that is being able to appreciate what others intentions are either linguistically or physically socially and so on so the message regarding how communication is affected is that challenges to communication in parkinson's arise not just from the quieter voice but there are also language and pragmatic uh, social interaction factors too and many issues relate not just to the expressive speaking side of communication but also to being able to understand and perceive changes and, and understand what what other people are trying to communicate to you so what kind of things might speech language therapists or what kind of things might be important when it comes to intervention for, for speech language change for communication changes first of all we'd recommend early referral of a person uh, early on after their diagnosis for education and awareness about the possibility of changes that might take place and also in case changes already have taken place to prevent maladaptive strategies developing so uh, strategies in, in communication that, that, that are going to make communication more difficult rather than less difficult also to support the speaker and importantly their family and friends in uh, how to manage conversations understand what things help in communicating and also to forestall any of the psychosocial risks that there are so supporting the person as, as a speaker and making sure that they're not giving up on communicating and this will happen partly through optimizing the communicative environment so removing barriers uh, but also educating people in in how communication takes place and, and what things are positive as regards communication getting into and staying in conversations and so on also speech language therapists need to help people with parkinson's and, and their partners to recognize when a breakdown in understanding has taken place so strategies for how to to monitor that uh, but also then how do you manage repairs how do you how do you get back on track to take the conversation forwards more direct work on voice and speech is often un undertaken but in parkinson's then it's usually in the direction of attention to effort so recalibrating the effort that, that you give to to talking and, and monitoring this this effort because in parkinson's it's not that you've got weaker muscles and as you would in some other kind of neurological disorders but the uh, the brain the sensory aspects of, of perceiving voice loudness and so on uh, are affected so you don't realize you're talking quieter so you have to recalibrate the, the effort there and one of the key methods for that is the Lee Silverman voice treatment but there are other similar treatments which which focus on this attention to effort rate controls controlling the rate of speech is also uh, a successful way of of helping people be more intelligible who have Parkinson's uh, but all these things need to be paired with strategies for transferring any gains you make in clinic transferring them out into the environment in, into day-to-day -day living and making sure that those those improvements uh, are maintained once you're outside of clinic people ask about whether or not the medications or uh, surgery that are available for people with Parkinson's uh, have a positive effect on speech as regards uh, medication then while well, we can say that uh, dopamine therapies improve some af aspects of speech this doesn't usually transfer into better intelligibility and when it comes to deep brain stimulation then the message is that either speech isn't altered it isn't improved in the same way that limb control can improve or speech may even uh, be worse after deep brain stimulation or with deep brain stimulation so the messages to take away uh, today are that communication changes in Parkinson's are more than just a quiet voice uh, in particular the language changes can have a subtle but uh, major impact on both the understanding and expression uh, for people with Parkinson's and direct work uh, to improve loudness and intelligibility intelligibility works so there's good evidence for that but it's also important to make sure that referral is early on after the diagnosis of Parkinson's to make sure that preventative work can be undertaken it's very important to have regular review because the situation changes through the course of Parkinson's and also the nature of the change that people uh, might 
the speech language therapist would give people with Parkinson's, that also needs to change over the course of Parkinson's. And also, it's important that uh, transfer and maintenance strategies to make sure that improvements are maintained outside of clinic are important. But a central message is that at any stage of Parkinson's, uh, I think we could be positive that uh, improvement will be possible. Some documents are uh, important uh, that you may be interested to look out for in the near future. So uh, the NICE guidelines for Parkinson's, the updated NICE guidelines for Parkinson's are, are due out for public consultation sometime uh, late July, early August. The Parkinson's UK National Audit Report, which included responses from 63 speech language therapy services, that's going to appear in the middle of July. And it's all, you may, might also look out for information about the Parkinson's uh, UK Excellence Network, which my colleague Claire here is going to tell you all about in just a moment. OK, thank you very much, Nick. So hello everyone, I'm Claire from Parkinson's UK and I work on the Excellence Network team. I'll give you a short overview of Parkinson's UK, the charity, and then tell you a little bit more about the UK Parkinson's Excellence Network, which Nick has just mentioned. So we are the Parkinson's Research and Support Charity, if you're not already familiar with us. We provide support to people affected by Parkinson's and all of those around them and the aim is that nobody should face Parkinson's alone. So the um, five-year strategy for Parkinson's that's recently been launched has several strands so we are hoping that better treatments can be developed in years and not decades and our research team plays a big part in that. Among the, um, the things the research team does is to support clinical trials and one that we will be interested in finding out the results from and which I'd like to let you know about is the PDCOM trial at the Birmingham Clinical Trials Unit at the University of Birmingham. So if you'd like to find out a little bit more about that, you can contact them at this email address. That trial is going to compare Lee Silverman voice treatment with standard NHS SLT and it's hoped that the findings will contribute to future guidelines and practice around Parkinson's. We're also wanting to equip people to live active and fulfilling lives through encouraging them to, to get involved with activities, to be positive and to stay informed. And we want to deliver quality service as a standard and this is where the Excellence Network comes in. So the UK Parkinson's Excellence Network was created in February 2015, so it's recently celebrated its first year. And you can see on the screen there the aims of the Excellence Network. This is a network that's led by professionals, so we support it from a facilitative point of view. So we will work with the professionals on resources, let them know about events, and also develop education for the members of the network. And we really want to encourage people to get involved. If you're not already involved, which I know some of you are, these are ways that you can be. So you can sign up for the, the newsletter. So signing up for the newsletter gives you membership of the Excellence Network. That email address, that, that sorry website address there is the link that will take you right through to the sign up page. But you can visit the online resource centre at parkinsons.org.uk excellence network and that's where you'll find all of the education resources and further details that's um, what the latest newsletter looks like and each of the, the newsletters have a blog from the, the lead of a particular group or region but we also want to encourage you to be the news you can submit your own blog which can appear as a news article on the online resource center so again contact us to find out how you can do that to share that best practice and you can join the, the group on LinkedIn. So search for the Excellence Network group on LinkedIn and get involved in the discussions there. And really, the Excellence Network needs you to tell them what you need to do your job well for people affected by Parkinson's. So please do have a look at what's happening and see how you can get involved. So within the Excellence Network, there are 20 regional groups, one for each UK region led by a clinical lead, and also thematic working groups and Nick is a member of the evidence-based practice group and these are all established around what needs has been identified through consultation with the clinicians and with people affected by Parkinson's and within that some special interest groups have started to emerge too so for example exercise professionals have got together and created their own group and will be feeding 
what they are finding out and doing back into the Excellence Network. So these images just demonstrate some of the, um, the resources that, that you are able to access through the Excellence Network. These two are obviously aimed at, at pharmacists, but we, we have a range of resources for all professionals from all backgrounds. Events take place, education. That's a shot of the online resource centre in blue there. So that's where you can go to download all of the resources or order them for free, access the education training and find out what's happening in terms of service improvement, such as the UK Parkinson's Excellence Network Audit, which, as Nick mentioned, will be coming out in mid-July. And the picture at the top there of that device, that is called the Parkinson's Kinetograph, which is a wearable piece of technology which measures levels of dyskinesia, that's involuntary movements in people with Parkinson's, and allows clinicians to download that data to look at treatment plans and work with that person to, to best figure out how their medication can work with them. So that's just a, a pilot that's been happening through the Excellence Network. So this, these are just examples of some of the activity that happens within the network. So I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have requested details of the Excellence Network, then some of you might have received those already. And if not yet, you'll be receiving it shortly after this webinar. Thanks very much. I'll hand you back over to Derek. Thank you very much, Claire. And thank you very much, Nick. Just for a couple of minutes, I'm going to mention for the mainly for the speech and language therapists online, some of what RCSLT offers in this area. If you're not a speech and language therapist, bear with us for the next couple of minutes because we'll be moving on to the question and answer session very shortly. Firstly, within the offer to speech therapists, clinical access networks, some of you may already be involved. There are some that are regional, some that are national, some specific to Parkinson's and others covering the wider neurological sector. There are also clinical resources online on the range of neurological conditions. There are access to expert advisors if you have particular cases and assistance you require. Nick is one of those expert advisors, so you can hear more of his, his words of wisdom. And obviously, you'll have seen pieces in the bulletin. The commissioning manuals are interesting. These are designed to help you make the business case to the people commissioning your service. And particularly relevant is the one on voice and also the one on dysphagia, which, broadly speaking, is problems with swallowing. There's also the research centre, which will take you to the latest evidence and also to journals that you might not otherwise be able to access. A lot of our work now is increasingly jointly with service users and the organisations that work on behalf of service users. And you'll see here some of what we did to highlight Parkinson's Awareness Week from the RCSLT policy feed. Our general offer to members is also relevant to those concerned with people affected by Parkinson's. The resources we have on building business cases, on local influencing, around the Giving Voice campaign, and also the influencing of NICE guidelines, sign guidelines in Scotland, government strategy and legislation throughout the United Kingdom. I mentioned that we're increasingly working with people with communication and swallowing needs as co-partners, and some examples of that would be work we're currently doing with Parkinson's and other neurological charities on making the commissioning case for neurological conditions. We're ramping up our service user engagement, some of it along with the allied health sector. Dysphagia, dysphagia I mentioned there, um, problems with swallowing. This is particularly important um, following the Francis review and concerns around patient safety and making sure that people with Parkinson's and other conditions can swallow safely and we may come back to that in the questions. And lastly, I will just mention our work on making environments communication inclusive and as part of that, I think just starting to do work now to think about a symbol a bit like the wheelchair symbol that might mean that communication needs were dealt with in that place. So let's move on to questions. I can see questions coming in thick and fast as we speak. We also had some questions in advance. First question I'm going to take is one to Claire. Claire, we've been asked by someone who says, I know there's a dementia champion. Is there such a thing as a Parkinson's champion? Do you want to explain that a wee bit? Thank you for that question. There isn't um, a full programme that mirrors the, um, the Dementia's Champion programme, but there's a small number of areas that are piloting a Parkinson's champion, mainly in acute trusts. 
it's very early days at the moment and um, our service improvement team is still waiting for information to come back but they are planning to work with the the Parkinson's nurses who've set up these programs to to really have a look at what's working and what can be taken forward from that to, to hopefully look at rolling that out a little bit further but in the meantime in, in terms of of some of the the work that a Parkinson's champion might do Parkinson's nurses exist in 80% of trusts and health boards across the UK and as well as their vital role in delivering Parkinson's care they also have a role around educating and informing health and social care colleagues in terms of Parkinson's so if you if you're not already in touch with your local Parkinson's nurse you can visit the uh, parkinsonsorg.uk website and under support for you you can pop in a postcode and it'll tell you who your local Parkinson's nurse is so you, you could get in contact and, and have a conversation with them in your own area. Thanks very much Claire. Nick we've, we've had a bundle of questions about swallowing I wonder, as I mentioned, we could have a whole webinar on that, but I wonder if you could touch very briefly on some of the issues around swallowing for people affected by Parkinson's. Yes, thanks. That, that's a very relevant question too, and, and obviously um, a whole field of speech-language therapist work uh, with people with Parkinson's is concerns changes to swallowing, and swallowing changes can be found right from the, from the earliest uh, stages of Parkinson's, uh, and it's very important to be aware of them Firstly, from uh, the health, quality of life related point of view. So a lot of the comorbidities in Parkinson's, especially later on uh, in the course of Parkinson's with uh, chest infections, pneumonias and ones which might lead to, to serious complications are associated with swallowing difficulties. So important to, to recognize those to, to prevent uh, those kind of problems arising but it also has uh, social implications so if people are having difficulty eating it leads to changes in family meal time routine going out for meals and so on and this has in turn has uh, kind of psychological effects I, I mentioned that it that you can detect changes in swallowing right from the earliest uh, stages of, of Parkinson's that that's on uh, assessments like uh, video fluoroscopy or fiber optic examination of swallowing but it doesn't usually manifest itself so obviously in uh, in change be eating behavior uh, in the early stages so if you ask the person have you got any problems with swallowing the answer would probably be no but if you ask questions around uh, have you noticed any uh, changes to how long it takes you to eat uh, around uh, things that you're having to start avoiding in your diet because they're, they're difficult to swallow or uh, changes in the way that um, you have to prepare meals now the, these are all kind of clues to well underlying changes to, to swallowing are starting to have an impact on the on the person's life so yes definitely an area to pay attention to uh, definitely an area to to assess for and and early on important to, the, probably the best way to pick them up is through changes to day-to-day to -day activities rather than necessarily changes on the video fluoroscopy or fiber optic examination of swallowing. That's great Nick, thank you. We've had a question from Samuel and he asks whether we have ideas on supporting people affected by Parkinson's and dementia. Um, Nick, do you want to pick that up first? Yes, I can pick up some aspects of that, yes. So uh, a sizable proportion of, of people with uh, Parkinson's do go on to develop uh, cognitive changes uh, de develop into uh, dementia. Uh, I guess on, on the, the one hand then the kind of support that can be given to people with Parkinson's with dementia is, is no different to the support you'd give anybody with dementia from, from other uh, etiologists so in, in terms of structuring the environment for them in terms of making sure that people communicating with the person with dementia are aware of the issues the challenges faced by by that person they, they adjust their communication uh, accordingly um, but also I guess in terms of if, if one's trying to involve the person in direct therapy for their for their voice loudness or for their word finding or whatever whatever it might be then obviously the, the the kind of instructions or the kind of programs the kind of goals that, that one would that, that one would use for the, to to get progress there would would be again the same as with other people with dementia so very straightforward instructions 
small reachable goals rather than big, big leaps forwards. Uh, one of the advantages that's often cited for the Lee Silverman voice treatment program is that it focuses on on just one single central message, speak louder, speak speak loud, Ra raise your voice. There's not a complicated set of instructions of taking a deep breath, right? When you're ready to speak, uh, make sure you start phonating, for voicing with the onset of the, the breathing, make sure you move your tongue up to the top of the mouth, get your lips together, all that whole string of instructions which would, would totally lose somebody with, uh, with cognitive uh, difficulties. So, so yes, keeping keeping instruction short, straightforward, short goals, uh, structuring the environment, working with uh, communication partners as well as the person with with the cognitive changes. Thank you, Nick. Claire, anything you'd like to add on the subject of dementia? Thank you. From a charity point of view, um, rather than, than clinical, um, to to add to what Nick's just said, we have a, a very comprehensive offer of support for people with Parkinson's, including Parkinson's dementia. So people can access support through us via our helpline, through local advisors who are available in every region, and also through the Parkinson's nurses, which I've mentioned before. So getting in touch with the charity is, is often a, the first step to take if someone hasn't already been put in touch with us. And Within the Excellence Network team here, there's been some research happening with care homes looking at Lewy Bodies dementia in particular and looking at the level of knowledge that exists in, in care homes around Lewy Bodies dementia. So looking at where gaps might be and how then the Excellence Network can work, to, work towards closing those gaps to, to inform more staff about working with people with Parkinson's and dementia. So again, the results of that research will be coming out through the Excellence Network and obviously work will come on the back of that, so do stay in touch with us about it. Thank you. I should say from the Royal College point of view that we have a whole um, awareness campaign around dementia and the, the communication and swallowing challenges of dementia. You'll find plenty of material on our website, including a whole webinar devoted to that very topic. We have a question from Emma in Oxfordshire. Um, and Emma has a question for both presenters. What role the Excellence Network can play in supporting collaboration in clinical research? Claire. Okay, thanks for the question. Well, earlier I mentioned the thematic working groups that exist within the Excellence Network. And there is a thematic working group on research. So looking at what trials might be in the pipeline that clinicians want to get involved in, uh, and also how people affected by Parkinson's can participate in that research as well. So that group does work very closely with our research team and with the research support network that Parkinson's UK coordinates, and that's all people affected by Parkinson's who are interested in getting involved in research and participating in trials. Um, so that, that that's one of the ways. And the research team will also look at supporting different pieces of research and giving advice around that and some of the Excellence Network members and leads are in the process of carrying out studies that Parkinson's UK are supporting and if you're interested in having a look at what's been going on with that and how those leads have been supported in their work then um, you can visit the research pages on the Parkinson's website and it'll give you a, a short breakdown of, of the different studies that have been taking place. Thank you. Nick, clinical research. Yes, as Claire mentioned, I, I sit on the, the, the evidence-based uh, subcommittee of the, of the Excellence Network, and that's a, a multidisciplinary committee, so I, so the other on, on there are health service researchers, there are neurologists, there are care of the elderly, there are consultants, there are uh, physiotherapists, there are pharmacologists, and pharmacists, and they're what we've been looking at in the work of the subcommittee so far are, are really themes which either are, are hot topics or burning issues for people with Parkinson's, so around falls, around uh, around differential diagnosis, around certain medications, and looking at what, what the, the best evidence in, from a clinical point of view is there, and then identifying areas of need in, in research which might then go on to be commissioned and Parkinson's UK is one of the largest supporters of, of research in Parkinson's 
in the world, not in, not just in the UK. And if you go to their website, you'll see the various schemes they've got either for short projects, for major program projects, or for PhD studies, for for exploratory studies, and so on. So in, going via the Parkinson's UK, uh, either making your views known or what kind of um, areas you would like to get into, or putting forward your own ideas and the team team's ideas of, of research you'd like to consider to the research funding team would be a direction to go. Thank you, Nick. Just got time for one more, if we can have a brief answer. Uh, Nick, it's probably for you. It's from somebody who works in a rural area and talking about it being difficult for patients to access therapy due to the long distances required to get to every session. Um, and they're asking what the evidence or what, what, what our view is around telehealth and telepractice, particularly with, um, with LSVT therapy. Yes, that, that's um, often a, a major barrier for people coming in for Lee Silverman voice treatment, which involves four sessions a week over four weeks. And if you've not not knit close to the clinic and haven't got the energy for, for that kind of commitment, it can bar you from, from that therapy. But there is evidence around that delivering, for instance, the Lee Silverman voice treatment remotely through through a computer is equally effective to delivering Lee Silverman voice treatment face-to-face. -face. So, so I think that's def definitely an option in, in this particular treatment thing. But there's also evidence around that carrying out assessments and carrying out reviews of, of speech motor control and intelligibility and uh, other aspects of speech and voice remotely via computer can be as valid and reliable and accurate as it can be in a in a face-to-face -face situation so so i think that there's definitely a, a case for introducing that that kind of um, access and that that kind of interaction into your clinical practice Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. And thank you to those um, who are still sending in questions as we speak. I'm afraid that that will have to do us for time for today. But as well as putting the webinar itself online and other material, we will, where possible, put up an answer to questions which have been asked which we weren't able to take today. Thank you to Claire and Nick for being our participants today. Thank you to the many participants uh, online and for the fact that as far as I can see, almost all of you have stayed until the end. Um, I know that many of you will be keen to get off for what I'm told is the pre-match build-up for Russia versus Slovakia. So I will let you do that, and we hope to have you joining us again on an RCSLT webinar sometime soon. Thank you, and good afternoon. Bye.